Okay. Do you see uh, my screen as, as yeah. one slide? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so I'll start. So uh, I've um, titled the, the, the lecture uh, architecture as a common framework. So of course, uh, making a claim that um, uh, architecture could act as a, a common framework really is to contend that uh, this approach uh, has a propensity or architecture therefore has a propensity for accommodation and this propensity actually comes from uh, untangling or unpacking the discursive relation between type and the idea of the city that is to say that uh, entering the discourse and understanding the city through its uh, true typology and locating it with its uh, most uh, common uh, element within the city. So such a view, of course, um, uh, presupposes that the architecture that arise out of the lessons that is drawn from the city, which is essentially their typical elements, uh, resonates with a certain common familiarity and purpose. So, of course, the pursuit of such an architecture uh, is, uh, as, an, as a common framework is not an attempt to revive a certain anachronistic image of the past, but in fact, it's a search for an idea that can be commonly held so as to invest architecture with a social uh, and cultural relevance. So this interest really arose uh, partly from our situation when we started off as a young practice and growing out of uh, different locations around the world. Uh, that was about 10 years ago. Uh, we started off in, in London, uh, myself and with Kapil in, in Mumbai, and now we have an office as well as uh, in, in Singapore. So it became apparent very quickly that we were both foreign uh, and in a way local indigenous at the same time. And the two common routes to practice in, in the globalized context is either to become a global architect with a signature style. Often it's non-contextual work propped up by claims of progress and usually technologically driven. And the other, of course, uh, is the other opposite end where an architect uh, becomes the gatekeeper of a particular cultural essence. That is to say that the architect uh, who the media will celebrate for their Chineseness, Indianness, Englishness, and so on. So we felt that uh, both approaches have something in common is that they focus too much on the uniqueness and, and in a desperate attempt to become different. So we instead wanted to focus on what is common, what is, uh, what is more uh, com uh, familiar and therefore wanted our architecture uh, different in the sense that it becomes uh, draws from something familiar to, to a context. So of course we are indebted to Rossi, especially in the way uh, Rossi discusses the way in which uh, architecture acts as a collective work of art. And his main premise uh, was that the city uh, um, uh, and its uh, comes from the city and its architecture. So his his book, uh, The Architecture of the Sixty, uh, the Italian version of 1963. Ross's was uh, response towards the general disillusionment and the failure of a unitary master plan or architectural modernism to respond and to reflect the reality and complexity of urban life. So uh, just to give a quick summary, of course, um, the most important concept that is put forth by Rossi in, in his thesis here is that uh, is, is the concept of the urban artifact. So for him, the urban artifact uh, should be understood in the Italian word fato urbano, which is in a way translated loosely, uh, means a physical thing of the city, but it is something that is imbued with all its history, geography, structure, and connection with the general life of the city. So in principle, Rossi therefore divides uh, this urban artifact to housing and monuments. So they, he says that to become an urban artifact, they have to be both propelling elements of the city and at the same time, a permanent structure of the city. And because of these two characteristics, they become the structure that holds the collective memory of the city. And in doing so, it becomes therefore the common artifact, uh, a common artifact. So this, this reading, of course, can be summarized uh, a bit in a cartoonish reduction by Leon Creer. In a sense, uh, summarizes our understanding of architecture of, uh, let's say, a historical European city. That is to say that the architecture of the city could be divided as housing or monument, rule and exception, right? So 
Rossi uses this uh, uh, example very, very well. Uh, of course, this is the Palazzo di Ragione in Padua, in which he argues that such a structure is an urban artifact because it has been in the it has been a propelling element of the city. That is to say, that it has been involved in the evolution and the life of the city through history. But at the same time, it is also a permanent structure that never, in a sense, change in its physical form and structure. So, for instance, here, the palazzo that you are seeing here has transformed its use from a aristocratic residence to a military barracks, to a market, to a school. So, in a way, such a, a building or a structure is impervious to programmatic failures and redundancy. And the structure remains permanent. So, therefore, the structure, in a sense, becomes a mnemonic structure. It holds the memory of the city, it's, it's involved in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the life of the city throughout, through the edges. So the other part in which uh, often people miss about this uh, page in, in Architecture of the City of Rossi is this little diagram here at the bottom right, and in which he begins to abstract the very irreducible structure, or what I call the deep structure of the palazzo, in which that structure never changed. But what changed throughout time is uh, its program and the way in which program begins to infiltrate and occupy the space and taking shape around the space. So I think armed with this uh, notion of a structure that is permanent but impervious to program, um, Rossi has created an incredible, incredible productive way of working. That is to say that to study elements that are permanent and that is involved in the life of the city and then to transpose that to architecture. So here is the three diagrams that is prepared by Rossi in his um, in his article, Due Progretti, that was uh, published uh, shortly after his two seminal projects. The top two diagrams uh, is the project of the Milan Triennale. In the middle is uh, Milan housing, the Galaratis housing, and at the bottom is San Rocco. And what's interesting here, he argues, is that, let's say, for the Milan Triennale housing, is essentially a structure that is taken off a store. One, uh, basically, is a colonnaded shops that you find very, very common in Italy, and in which he transposed that very structure to become an exhibition space for the Milan Triennale, where the walls begins to elongate uh, and to shorten at certain spaces, walls between walls begins to, to broaden and to tighten, thereby giving a rich array of exhibition space. But once that is transposed from an architecture uh, from the historical city. So these two moments right, uh, of history and presentness of the store and of an exhibition space begins to, to collapse in one moment what Rossi calls as the architecture of the city. So uh, uh, another very good example, of course, is the Milan housing in which he argues the same here, where he says that he draws from a very uh, familiar uh, colonnaded structure where he imposes two moments, he calls. On the top is the moment of uh, the residence, uh, a, a space which is intimate, which is domestic. But the same structure which you see at the top, the wall is imprinted as, a, uh, as an elongated wall that becomes a portico space, which he says is a street and a container for social life to unfold, in wait for to unfold. So this collapse of uh, housing as well as the portico of the monument, really I think it's a very productive way of looking at the way in which we draw very typical element of the city and to create a new architecture does it, that is at once uh, familiar but also strange and surprising. So let's say taking for another example, now looking eastwards, uh, if the deep structure of the historical European city can be understood as the dialectics of rule and exception, housing and monuments, as I said, in the Chinese city, I argue, is constructed out of one dominant type. For instance, here we see is the courtyard house and its corresponding deep structure, uh, the, the, courtyard, uh, the courtyard walled house. So the Chinese courtyard house should not be confused with all other courtyard configurations that we see the world over. And of course, the most pronounced difference is that the void of the courtyard is not carved out of a mess. In fact, it is formed instead by the placement of one or two single room pavilions that are then walled uh, off from its surrounding. So this courtyard houses ag aggregates to form entire neighborhoods, so hutongs as they call it in Beijing, leaving very narrow lanes between courtyard houses. So this houses does not have 
uh, an articulated frontal elevation, for it will not be viewed in axial perspective uh, from a distance. Uh, it is experienced instead in sequence, where one moves from wall to courtyard, to pavilion, to another courtyard. So this sequence of open, uh, open and closed space, a space for nature and dwelling, really adheres to the yin-yang concept of alternation uh, of binary opposites that is rooted uh, in, in Taoist principles. So this, one could argue that therefore this singular deep structure that defines the entire city at various scales, so it's defined by essentially various city walls, one that defines the extreme border of the original city. So for instance, for the seat of the, of the emperor and, and bringing it down to a scale down uh, to, to the scale of the neighborhood. Uh, and it really is demonstrated by the very same uh, singular deep structure, that is to say the walls enclosing an agglomeration uh, of uh, pavilion. So another important observation that could be made here is that the same deep structure is also similarly like Ross's example, is independent to program. That is to say that the same courtyard house uh, is used to serve as dwellings for a family and administrative offices for the state, schools, clinics, clan association, and it really indexes uh, and all multiple functions of the city. So let's say moving from, this, uh, from, from the architecture of the city, another example that illuminates our thinking about type and its trope of precedent, seriality and commonality uh, here is the work of Edmund de Waal. In this example, uh, you can see that each and every one of these objects are different, but yet they also share something familiar. And precisely in bringing them together within a frame, their difference become meaningful. The frame not only becomes a platform for singularity to exist in difference, but more importantly, it declares unequivocally what is common among those singularities. So what is striking to me is also the, the care and varieties of ways in which Deval treats uh, this act of framing and placing, right, in terms of its variable heights and, and, and dimensions, the thickening of certain borders and the thinning, thinning of certain shelves. So, so, so far our work has been, uh, I would say, it's really about this propensity of architecture to accommodate difference. Uh, and it serves as a backdrop for programmatic life to unfold, really drawing from these three examples that I very, very quickly run through with you. So I, I would say that so far I see that our architecture is mute, uh, but we hope that they resonate Although it's mute, I hope that they resonate with a strange familiarity in the context in which it's uh, sitting. So I'll speak about uh, perhaps five of these models that we have used so far, the platform, the courtyards, the veranda, tables and walls. Uh, I think I'll leave out the votes for today. Yeah. So maybe let's start with uh, um, Oasis Terraces, the, uh, the one that... Um, uh, Felipe just mentioned uh, very briefly. So this project was completed this year. Um, uh, it's, it's a new generation of neighborhood centers uh, for uh, housing and uh, development board, uh, which is the government body that builds 80% of uh, public or social housing in Singapore. So, uh, so when, when we first started, uh, the brief which was prepared by HDB uh, called for the creation, uh, they call a new typology. One uh, that integrates a neighborhood center, uh, as well as uh, uh, bringing together communal amenities, shopping and polyclinic, all sandwiched between an LRT station on the south and a waterway uh, on the north. The focus of the brief, unlike other uh, developer-driven commercial development, was to create and to provide great public spaces to, as a means to strengthen uh, community bonding. So, uh, so where do we look uh, uh, in, in, in such an example? So, of course, Colas in his Harvard Guide to Shopping wrote that in almost a cynical way that shopping is arguably the last remaining form of public activity. Although insightful in certain measures, I think that there are other ways in which we could think about public activities and how they could be nurtured. However, to date, uh, I, I would argue that the architecture in shopping, architecture of shopping in Singapore is this. It's, a, it's this uh, proliferation of ubiquitous shopping malls, superfluous monuments of consumption uh, as public activity. And its role really is to internalize all activities, drawing the lifeblood from the streets uh, and the city. 
And polyclinics and hospital, on the other hand, are this, often designed and built as independent buildings, set away from other programs and resources associated with the public realm. And the closest independent typology of the community center historically, actually, is the town hall. But in Singapore, uh, such a precedent does not exist. So what do we do? So the main challenge uh, for this project, therefore, was uh, for us, it's not only to bring together this disparate programmatic component together uh, in the new building typology, but also to harness an architectural grammar that will create a meaningful communal spaces and to allow the architecture really to script a programmatic strategy that will foster a sense of belonging. So where do we look for precedent? So we thought that since more than 80% of Singaporeans live in public housing, the architecture of Singapore's uh, uh, social housing or HDB has grown over the years and can be termed as a common architecture and has this uh, 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 very modest uh, equal, equalizing artifact that is able to accommodate uh, the plurality of life. So this architecture of HDB, especially in the 70s and 80s, uh, has this quality of an open framework and an, an unassuming structural expression of what it contains. In fact, it can be argued that one of the most successful containers of social life in Singapore is the HDB void deck on the ground floor an open structure that is able to move from poetic emptiness in wait for social life to unfold or to a space of celebration. So this is a, a wedding that happens in the very same space or also in death where the same space is also used uh, for funerals. So, so this is a space uh, I would uh, simply argue is a space for everyone to be at ease. In other words, uh, this form of architecture acts as a framework, a container of social life, therefore a common architecture. So our approach really was to draw from this precedent, uh, which is the architecture of housing uh, to create this new typology. And we wanted to create uh, this, uh, this architecture that will suppress the visual noise of a shopping center uh, and, and the clinical architecture of hospital. And instead have an architecture that figures forth uh, the communal space first and foremost. So these communal spaces are expressed in three ways. The first is a large all weather community event space, a sheltered plaza for the tropics. The second is the cascading communal garden where communal horticulture can, propose, uh, can promote a sense of belonging to the place. And third is the veranda spaces, the space that allows program to spill out to the exterior, animating the facade of the building. This veranda can also act as environmental buffer, cutting rain and sun from direct contact with the skin of the building. So our first thought is that the neighborhood center should be conceived as a singular building that frames and cradles the garden. The garden that then fronts the waterway, creating a natural amphitheater towards the water edge. This garden cascades down the entire height of the building and draws program and dining activities to the water edge. A gentle ramp provides easy access to all gardens and terraces, and they articulate the surface of the slope into several terraces, defining and shading uh, each, each space. So shopping is visible, it's vibrant, uh, and eating activities spill out onto the veranda, but they never drown out uh, the public realm. So the terraces are filled with outdoor communal spaces. Uh, here, for instance, you see a play area fronting a pediatric clinic. And through, through, through the months uh, now, as the garden matures, the ram now cuts across the different terraces uh, and with each turn revealing different pockets of communal spaces. Here, a hammock, a seat, a platform uh, to stretch out on and so and so forth. And, upon, if, and if you take the, uh, the ram upon reaching the roof and then turning one's gaze back onto the terrace, uh, a, a really beautiful view opens up to the waterways and beyond. Uh, the terrace continues all the way to the roof um, where it's used uh, as urban farms for a community horticulture club and also uh, exercise areas uh, for senior citizens. Uh, 
So together, uh, the communal spaces envelops the entire project. Uh, each elevation is seen as a communal space. Uh, and upon framing the cascading gardens, the second act, of course, was to frame and define a sheltered community plaza. So this volume is well-defined, four-story tall, sheltered from the elements. Uh, and you have a pedestrian circulation that is threaded through its site so that a meaningful space could be carved out. Uh, this space uh, um, is, 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 uh, divides um, the polyclinic on your right hand side and of course the communal facility on the on the left hand side and the slight angling of the facade draws pedestrian movement uh, from the station as well as Pungol Drive uh, where the bus stop is and the entrance is accentuated by a gentle angle so that the facade facing the LRT station almost uh, sort of creaks open to create a doorway uh, into the uh, into the triple volume space and then the triple volume space funnels uh, people through to a four-story sheltered space and through then this um, uh, the plaza is strategically placed at the crossing uh, of the waterways and the landing of the pedestrian bridge so this the space uh, is framed by a set of uh, double columns uh, what Ren would call a uh, uh, a facade uh, intercolumnation of a plated grid of an ABAB rhythm. And when it rains uh, or when the sun is at its most searing, the blinds will drop to further shade the space. So this deliberately porous facade both defines and allow permeation through this threshold. And the portico space entrance give uh, to us at least a sense of civic dignity as one passes through uh, from space to space. So each floor is surrounded uh, uh, by open terraces, by hanging gardens that overlooks the communal gardens in the platform, and they become a key feature uh, of the elevation. The depth uh, also is, uh, of the veranda is translated to communal dining space where you see it really comes alive. Uh, at night, uh, a program really migrate outwards in a hot and uh, humid tropical climate. And of course, there are also blinds uh, for sunscreen and for uh, when it rains. So when it, this is when it is all closed, all the spaces are well protected. So the service facade is also cladded with precast stained concrete and together with the double column of Offers a rich level of uh, cultivating a sense of community. More often than not, uh, architecture that are restrained, rational, repetitive, are derided for its lack of exuberance. But precisely, this quality uh, is what I would argue that makes the architecture of public housing so familiar uh, to Singaporeans. And, 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 and we really wanted to use this framework and learning from this framework to draw on uh, the diversity of life using architecture as a mute background. So, so, so this is just uh, completed, uh, as I said earlier this year. So uh, very, very quickly, uh, we, after uh, winning the competition of Oasis Terrace, we also won a competition for, um, to design the new School of Design and Environment, uh, also in Singapore. Uh, where the site uh, of our project is located just at the south end of the existing uh, School of Design and Environment. It's in red. That was built in the 70s. Um, and the available plot for the fourth building to the school is actually very, very tight. Uh, it just occupies uh, the, the southern corner. So looking from the south, uh, from the approach of the south, you can see that the site is a small, beautiful hill surrounded by mature trees. So the design brief uh, for the project uh, that was given to us was that the new building must embody and also facilitate the research and pedagogical direction of the, of, the, of the school. And the key challenge for the design was to create a net zero energy building. That is to say that uh, the building has to produce more or equal to the energy that it consumes. Now in the tropics, this uh, amounts to approximately 40 to 50% of energy reduction for a building of this size. So that's really not easy because uh, in Singapore, which is one degree north of the equator, uh, in other words, it's very hot and humid. And for the past 20, 30 years, uh, all new work and learning environments are like this, fully glazed, airtight buildings 
with massive dependency on air conditioning. So this mechanical systems takes up, the typical mechanical uh, cooling system takes up about 60% of total building energy consumption and about 40% uh, of the building budget and of course lots and lots of uh, spaces and plant rooms. So where do we look? Uh, for precedence again, and this time round, we looked at architecture before the arrival of air conditioning, and in particular to the precedent of the Malay house in the region. So there were three lessons to be drawn here. Uh, first, of course, is the house is raised on a platform, allowing ventilation below the building. Second, uh, the large and generous overhang roof shield uh, of the roof shield spaces from the searing sun and three shallow rooms are placed loosely next to each other but always detached allowing air to pass through these rooms so perched on top of the of this hill the new building is composed of a series of boxes loosely placed on large platforms a large roof then shields uh, this uh, loosely placed rooms from the overbearing sun and at the same time harness its energy. A large five-story screen uh, with buffer space uh, will cut away the direct sun from uh, the east and west. So the resultant is a school that has a very clear and legible organization, is open and permeable, but without the associate, uh, associative heat gains. So the completed uh, building uh, now perched just above the tree canopies, and the large roof is used an, as an expansive solar farm as well as a teaching space. So a total of 2,444 PV panels are placed on the roof. Uh, and the and and the maximum amount of energy that the PV could produce within the footprint of the building is only limited to 500 megawatts uh, per hour per annum. And however, uh, for an educational building of this size, typically you need almost about 2,000 megawatt uh, hour per annum. So to create a net zero energy building, we needed to save about 75% of reduction in energy consumption. So what do we do? The conventional approach to cooling building uh, in a hot and humid climate is to use an operative temperature of 24 degrees Celsius. However, if we use an, uh, an adaptive comfort approach, we can use an operative temperature of say 27 or 28 degrees Celsius, but together with the tempered and moving air, in other words, we can feel thermally comfortable if we can remove heat from our body rather than the conventional approach of blowing very cold air onto our skin. So therefore, sectionally, the spaces are configured to be shallow, right? to hover above open platforms, to allow natural cross ventilation to cool all the spaces. So by utilizing only about 17% of conventional AC, reserved only for labs, 46% of the cooling will be through uh, natural ventilation and 26% from hybrid cooling. So relying largely on just how we arrange the volumes and using platforms and overhangs, we were able to achieve a 74.5% of energy saving and thereby, uh, and, some, and all of this comes from uh, the cooling load alone, and thereby bringing down the energy consumption to meet with the energy production of the building, therefore making a net zero energy building. So the building, there are five levels to this, uh, each uh, different uh, with different type of learning space. Uh, as the spaces are conceived as loose boxes placed on large platforms, so ample landscape and breakout spaces are available for the users. Circulation uh, spaces wrap around uh, the northern edge of the building, and this tube-like corridor and staircase are almost like elongated breakout rooms, fostering interaction and chance encounters among students and staff. So circulation, learning, and social spaces are, are configured to intersect one another. They pierce through uh, each other. Here, you see the crit space uh, or presentation rooms uh, drops down into a ray social plaza. So it is visible from all approaches to the building. This space is also directly next to the open studios uh, and main circulation spine uh, on the foreground where you're viewing. And it's the most visible part of the school so that the act of presenting, debating and winning over an audience is central to the life of the school. There are two types of studio spaces. The first uh, is contained within the large platform. Uh, 
So this is the largest floor plate uh, organized in three bands, services and circulation, sh shared facility and open studio space uh, used by the lower years. So this studio uh, uses, utilizes hybrid cooling from 12 to 5 p.m. and natural ventilation in the late afternoons and early evening. This is where the biggest savings in energy consumption is. The studios are light filled, they're transparent with open views to the sea and yet suffers no direct heat gain uh, from the sun. So the platform here is lifted, clearly visible from the approach uh, to the campus, so that the life of the studio is always visible within the campus itself. Sitting above the platforms uh, are studios. Uh, this room-like studio sit uh, amidst gardens with very, very large overhang roof, providing shelter from the sun and rain and creating very pleasant breakout gardens fronting the studio. These spaces are used uh, actually by postgrads and researchers, so they are more room-like rather than studio-like uh, spaces. So as work and learning becomes increasingly collaborative and thus social, uh, the, cor the corresponding spaces are catered for. So here, a social plaza is surrounded by shared amenities like lab, seminar rooms, library, hot desking studio, gallery, and a cafe. So users and the students uh, of the building approach the, the, the school from the bottom of the hill via two tube-like staircases framed within a six-story portico and mature trees and arriving at a social plaza at, that, uh, at the level of the tree canopies and, and, uh, and also approaching from the existing building from where you're seated, it culminates really on this level. So all circulation, meet at this level and the space and views therefore opens up to the landscape and the sea views beyond. So all, all mature trees uh, and, uh, are protected and preserved uh, in the making of this building, the placement of structure and rooms uh, worked around this building uh, and really so this building is conceived uh, as a living labor laboratory where for instance the east and west facade which is exposed to the most searing sun is clad with a perforated aluminium curtain and is demountable for students and researchers to mount their prototype and facade uh, for tests, uh, physical tests against the sun and the rain. So yeah, we, we love this a lot. I, I, we feel that the soft irregular folds of the aluminium panel is so almost akin to, uh, to a curtain and brings a soft and delicate uh, expression to an otherwise very raw uh, and rough building. So they act like also like uh, day curtains from the inside, modulating the sunlight and also keeping the rain out of the interstitial space. So when we started, we, we were actually not sure if we could actually achieve a net zero building of this size and scale, but we're happy to say that after one year of operation, we actually produce a surplus of energy. So not even zero, it's a surplus. So this is now used by uh, Singapore's Building Construction Authority as a benchmark to push uh, the industry towards a super low energy status by 2030. Uh, and proud to say that actually we, we were also able to instigate a culture change in how we use and inhabit a building and how we perceive what thermal comfort is and thereby using architecture to shift uh, uh, the way in which we understand the use of a building. So maybe I run through with you uh, two, uh, tr maybe three more projects, uh, maybe now moving away from Singapore, uh, looking at India. So this is a uh, Sri Much uh, Rajchandra Ashram. So the site um, is in Dharampur. Uh, it's about four hours drive from Mumbai. Uh, the brief uh, was uh, called for a satsang hall, translated as a discourse hall, that will sit about 5,000 people uh, with meditation halls and meditation rooms of different sizes, uh, libraries, supported by libraries, classrooms, uh, basically for a lived-in population of about 10,000 people. So the available site uh, is, is a, actually a very beautiful site. This was taken pre-monsoon, so it's pretty uh, uh, um, barren with, with, without green. But of course, when there is a monsoon, it turns green. So the available site uh, comes in a shape of a crescent-shaped plateau. And when completed, uh, the ashram will house a lived-in population of about 10,000 devotees. And the satsang hall, uh, right in the middle of the valley, uh, will be the main building uh, and is situ situated at the middle of a crescent facing uh, the valley uh, that is dropping down towards the, the, uh, the west. 
So this five seater satsang hall, uh, our design is really informed by this uh, concept of summer, uh, summer vasaran is, is, is drawn from this Jainism concept. Uh, loosely uh, uh, summarized, uh, it is really about um, the concept that speaks of the aggregation of knowledge through discourse and learning, where uh, this knowledge uh, and discourse is used as a building blocks, where, where it brings a devotee uh, closer and closer uh, to a sense of enlightenment. So this concept is actually evident in almost all Jain temples, uh, where the aggregation of self-similar elements create a shikara that reaches uh, towards the sky. So you see that almost in all Hindu temples. So the satsang hall does uh, draws from this concept and consists of 13 stack rooms where these rooms get smaller the higher they go. Uh, and, and, this, and as they go higher, the rotation uh, aligns the, the entrances uh, to cardinal uh, direction. So for instance, here, it aligns the entrance of the building to the temple on the right and the dining hall to the left and the amphitheater uh, facing the valley that cascade downwards. So the rooms are also rotated 45 degrees as they are stacked uh, and, and it creates uh, a, a really beautiful, uh, I would say a shikara type of uh, silhouette that, that I just showed you. So. The building uh, will be clad uh, by hand chip marble, about 300 by five, uh, 300, centi uh, 300 millimeter by uh, 50 milli millimeter strips, and they will be hand chip and, and uh, assembled on site. So as uh, at the base, at the largest hall, uh, it sits a, cap a capacity of 5,000, is placed uh, on this uh, ground floor, four large slightly curved arches uh, in blue, essentially transfers the load from the rooms above, creating a column-free drum with a diameter of uh, 55 meters. It's, it's, it's really huge. So the main foyer uh, from the ground is accessible from uh, all eight corners of the building. And the main building entrance uh, faces the valley is formed by two angled vestibules, allowing men and women uh, to enter separately, uh, but at the same space. So the drum, is immediately uh, visible as uh, and felt in the in the foyer as you enter the building allow an intuitive wayfinding as you walk along the building so the main discourse hall sits about 5000 people uh, and the stage is slotted uh, into the arches on one side of the drum uh, perforated timber panels uh, are used as acoustic baffles uh, and as devotees seat cross-legged on the on the floor uh, there are actually no seating uh, in this hall in itself so four circulation uh, cores connect the ground floor to the balcony level and further up to the classroom and as the building progresses up and it rotates uh, creates uh, smaller and smaller rooms and finally uh, culminating uh, in the main meditation hall with the tallest volume so here the volume tapers upwards uh, and ends with the skyline so this is a, a, a drone image that we took about three, four months ago, or maybe yeah, just before COVID. And you could begin to see uh, the circular drum and the arches holding the load that is transferred as the rooms begins to rotate 45 degrees uh, as, as, as it rotates. So these are also some that are taken, uh, the, the precast walls, uh, in situ walls going up, um, with, with the perforated openings where we begin to. And these are the tests of the circular openings. Uh, this, this is the uh, satsang hall, the discourse hall. You could begin to see the incredible thinness of the arch wall, the crossing arch wall that transfers the load from all the rooms above and yet creating a 55 story, um, sorry, a 55 meter uh, column free space. So uh, moving again from, from India, uh, this, this now also a building that was just completed about a year and a half, Jamil Arts Center. So the project uh, is located uh, at uh, the Dubai Creek, uh, just uh, as you see, just at the island that you see in the middle of the image. Um, one of the key um, uh, 
challenges was to use um, a community building like that, an arts building to anchor uh, an urban plan that is meant to be uh, uh, Dubai's first cultural village. So when we first started, uh, we, we were very impressed uh, by the way in which um, the Jamil Arts uh, very much wanted an art center that is dedicated uh, to MENA, uh, that is uh, MENA Arts, that is to say Middle East uh, and North African art. Uh, it's one of the major first major centers in the world. Uh, they really wanted uh, to, to not only uh, think about the art, but also to use this space as a community center. So we thought, looking at the region, what were the precedents that we could look at? So we looked at the Sha'abi housing uh, in Dubai uh, and then in the Emirates that was built in the 70s. Uh, basically, they were government housings that are composed of, again, loose rooms and pavilions that is then quadrant off by a perimeter wall. And this courtyard spaces is both intimate, private, but also social in nature. And of course, when you begin to aggregate them within the city, you really get a, a combination of these two moments, right, of a, of a communal common space and, a, and an inward looking uh, private dwelling space in, in one gesture. So the project uh, therefore utilizes uh, this notion of aggregation of rooms and, and colonnades and walls to create a, a, a complete project. So uh, there are three components to this. Um, the art spaces, which is made up of gallery boxes, the enterprise boxes, which is uh, meant for the administration as well as uh, artists in residence, and the dining space, which is the restaurant. So this three cluster of boxes is tied together by a colonnaded wall, almost like a mat building, and they really tie this building and create front, active frontages towards uh, the promenade uh, of, of the waterfront that we see here. So in plan, uh, you begin to see these two spaces that I'm talking uh, about just now, almost like a mat building where the, uh, there, there's these two moments of courtyard space and internalized uh, rooms uh, that you move from room to room. And the colonnade really activates the promenade and opens up an otherwise uh, a very close and inward typology, which is the typology of the art gallery or art museum. So here it opens outwards. So this mat building uh, uh, on the ground floor is incredibly porous. So you always enter the building uh, filtered through uh, the colonnade and the colonnade not only allows that filtration of uh, uh, pedestrian movement, but also it frames critically four courts and courtyards that brings you to the space. So this is the way in which you approach the building. The, the colonnade is incredibly visible. It's fronted by a plaza uh, on, on, on the land side and towards the water side. The colonnade uh, activates and opens up uh, the courtyards as well as the lobby spaces uh, uh, towards the waterfront. So uh, the courtyards also therefore becomes incredibly important. We worked with Anouk Vogel, super talented uh, landscape artist and designer, in which when we worked with her, we, we asked her uh, and, and, and told her that uh, the courtyard spaces is not uh, only a a social space, but uh, to but it ha also has this potential to almost become a blank canvas for landscape. So she really took the cue uh, from us and to begin to use this seven courtyards that is distributed on two levels of the project and made them as blank canvas where she begins to curate different desert plants from different desert biomes all over the, the world. So it's almost like a Jamil Art Center collects art from uh, globally, she begins to collect plants from different desert climates. So, so, so the first courtyard or the forecourt that is immediately visible is screened uh, from the plaza, entrance plaza, by this colonnade. And as you begin to enter, you begin to see this uh, arrangement of really beautiful plants, almost like sculptures that are arranged uh, for, for, for interaction, for viewing and to pass through uh, the meandering paths with, within this. So as you enter uh, from the outdoor space into the first lobby, so this lobby is open and transparent, uh, uh, is surrounded by four different courtyards and, and 
the gallery spaces are also arranged in such a way that create a room to room concept but it's, it's, it's arranged in such a way that when you begin to move from room to room you always uh, will encounter a, a, a courtyard or, a, or a, a, a garden so for instance here as you move from the lobby to a gallery space you are confronted by Anouk's gardens again the placement of these plants almost becomes a, a, another gallery of nature in itself so as you move from this uh, gallery to, to the other, you always get this glimpse out uh, into these courtyards and there are uh, doors that really invites you to get out uh, into this courtyard, to inhabit these courtyards. So also, uh, reading rooms, library, admin spaces uh, have these moments, the moment uh, between uh, the rooms as well as the colonnade. So these uh, courtyards are placed at uh, on on two different levels, and yeah, and and of course, I think looking from afar, I think uh, yeah, we felt that uh, it has a very beautiful expression uh, using very, very thin uh, aluminium uh, panels, almost like a thin piece of paper and scroll that uh, adorns uh, the, the the building. So I'll just run through. This is the I'm almost done. The second last project. Uh, all the, all the projects that I've shown you is either built or almost built. So I'm just, I'm just sharing you a project that is not successful, that is not built and in which we didn't win. So the rest we did. But it's something that we felt uh, um, very close to our hearts in this, in this building. This, this is in London. Um, it was a competition for uh, the expansion of uh, RCA, uh, the Royal College uh, of Arts. So the yellow is uh, the existing school and the red uh, is the new site for, for the expansion of about 15,000 square meters. So when we, when we started, uh, we felt that in today's uh, creative education, we really feel that um, learning is becoming more social. Uh, therefore, collabor collaborative space is very important, but uh, the space for contemplation, the space for quiet learning is also increasingly important, precisely because we are so distracted all the time. So therefore, we felt that the new school should actually have two moments, right? That is to say that a corresponding precedent of a factory floor uh, as a space of of uh, production and 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 this uh, and collaboration, but also a studiolo, where you have a private quiet learning space that is also within a larger space. So this two space translates itself uh, in what we call as uh, tables. Uh, what we mean by table is this. So to that, that is to say that the table uh, defines a space, but the table is never uh, defines a space by its four legs, but it never encloses. And the top of the table becomes a space that is open for the display of knowledge or the display of social life and so on. So if you begin to compare, let's say, a floor that is repeated in a in a grid versus one that is created by tables, one could argue that different faculties or different schools could inhabit the different tables. There's a cross cross-pollination of space, but yet each school and each faculty will still have its distinct space, although uh, 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 not uh, enclosed and therefore, therefore, and therefore uh, avoids uh, the site creating silos uh, or disciplinary silos within the school. So th therefore, by bringing the tables together, we really felt that all the different schools and faculty from fashion to landscape, interior, sculpture, fine arts, architecture, could all be seen in one single gaze as one approaches the school. And the vitality, the richness, the diversity of the school could be visible, uh, could not, could be felt, it could be seen and could be experienced uh, uh, in, in one go. So here, for instance, you see that uh, it, within this table, one could say that uh, the interior design uh, faculty or the landscape faculty could overlook students of sculpture presenting their work and vice versa. And at the top floor, for instance, we, we bring a sawtooth uh, a structure very much like a factory, drawing light into the open table that I mentioned you about as a space that is open for, for a different multiple occupation. 
So complementing uh, the table, we also have the shelf. Uh, we see that the shelves uh, act almost uh, as a democratic cellular space that is open to all. Now, why we feel this is important is because that if you look in, in uh, schools of design and, and faculties, when you begin to nest, uh, let's say different seminar rooms and let's say a laser cutter room and computer room within different floors, each faculty and each school begins to colonize this space and, and make it their own and therefore again create silos and, uh, and nesting to, towards the space. Whereas let's say if you begin to uh, uh, as a, a tableau or as a shelf, uh, they become visible, uh, they become connected to the tables, but they always becomes uh, open to all and more democratic in that sense. So we felt that therefore the tables uh, really is also therefore becomes a display of all the shared facilities uh, within the school. So within a single gesture, uh, uh, almost within a flat plane, you begin to see seminars happening, lectures, uh, let's say a photo shoot taking place within it. And lastly, a third element, uh, we've provided a screen of staircases. Uh, almost by over-provision by two times. Uh, really, the, the, the emphasis here is to begin to create uh, extreme connectivity so that you create uh, um, uh, uh, easy access between the shelves as well as the tables. So one could say that the circulation space between the two is what draws the table and the shelves as a complete project. So together, the shelf and the tables create this beautiful moment. So the way in which this, the project is situated uh, uh, is two ways. One, of course, in red on the left, diagram. Uh, there's a very, very busy road, with this, which is uh, the South Battersea Road. The building is set back a little bit uh, to create a, a foreground to the building. And then uh, the main lobby uh, traces a line from the existing building, so that as you begin to approach the building from a busy road, there is a moment of relief, that is to say that uh, a, a, a forecourt within a very, very tight site. And then there is a very small portico space, the first table that invites you in. And from the first table, you enter into the table and you begin to see spaces, uh, workshops below you, as well as the spaces above you. And if you were coming in on the left-hand side from the existing building, you'll end up within the first lobby of the building with the existing back gardens on the right hand side and really your eye is therefore drawn uh, diagonally upwards to all the different tables that begins to stack up and display the different rooms uh, of the different faculties so yeah so we we were really gutted when we didn't win this because we thought that we really loved this project but sometimes you you win sometimes you lose um, this is the last project I want to share with you. Uh, I put this the last, although it is the first project uh, that we won in an open anonymous competition that really started uh, the, the, the office uh, in, in, in a very uh, accelerated space, uh, accelerated pace. So this is uh, the new Singapore State Courts. Uh, so the site that was given is incredibly tight. Uh, the building that you see in front of you, uh, that's uh, the Octagon building, that's the existing uh, court that is being used uh, uh, to, uh, for the last 20, 30 years. So this building is to be preserved. We are asked to basically insert a, a building right at the car park where you see uh, here. So like all uh, court uh, courthouses, uh, there's a reason why you end up with buildings like this, incredibly solid, uh, with very, very complicated um, uh, circulation patterns. So for instance, here, you will see that uh, those multiple corridors that you see, those are the corridors that separate three uh, circulation routes that should not be mixed in this typology. That is the circulation of the judges, the accused or the defendant, uh, and the public circulation. So this tree circulation cannot, uh, are not allowed to cross, but at the same time, they have to culminate in, a, in, in the same courtroom. So this has always been the difficulty in looking at the typology of courthouses. So our response was to actually do this, is to create two towers that is linked by 38 bridges with a, a garden slotted uh, between uh, the two buildings. So the, build, the tower at the back is dedicated to the court staff and the judges, uh, the officials of the courts. And the front tower uh, is an open tower uh, in which 
is made up of different platforms and in which we begin to slot 68 uh, uh, courts, uh, comprising of criminal courts um, and civil courts. So this has taken about two months, uh, three months just before COVID hit Singapore. It was just about to, to, to be completed. So it sits just uh, in front of the octagon. So you see the two towers sliding just off each other. Linking the two buildings uh, is a plaza space uh, and an entrance pavilion, linking the old building and the new building. So uh, we, we've also, uh, within, uh, in, in doing this building, we really looked at uh, essentially two very typical uh, architectures in the site, uh, in Chinatown. That is to say that the uh, ubiquitous high rise you see in Singapore, and in the foreground, the granular, very, very small scale shop houses. So we really wanted to bring these two moments together. So therefore you begin to see the granularity of the shop house is translated as, um, as the court boxes that is sitting on multiple or multiplied ground planes and on this ground planes are placed um, uh, not only the court boxes but also uh, public spaces that are accessible and this landscape uh, on every level. So this open public space and for the court users are uh, incredibly important because they, in a sense, they are very therapeutic in nature because uh, um, uh, court proceedings are very stressful. So these spaces are really spaces for repose and, 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 and the calming spaces for the court users. So this, this image, you begin to see the different heights of the platforms uh, expanding and contracting. And, and because of this multiple volumes, this begins to house court rooms and court boxes of uh, different, different sizes. So this was taken just in construction. So at certain angles, there's an extreme uh, slimness to, to the office tower and yet bound together by 38 bridges. Uh, bringing, connecting the judges' uh, spaces to, to the court. So we also begin to draw on certain details. So this is the shop houses that you see. We feel that there's a very beautiful uh, uh, tactility to, to, to the Chinatown roof. So we wanted to create the same tactility to, to each and every platform, lobby space. So we tried many, many uh, uh, ways and we settled upon uh, using a precast uh, pigmented stained concrete where uh, each panel uh, really has a different uh, gradation of um, not only grooves as well as inflection points but also each and every panel feels and is actually handmade so the concrete is pigmented with color and then is stained over uh, by a concrete sealer so when put together, each uh, platform begins to house uh, these fluted elements. These precast elements are uh, incredibly huge. They are six meter tall, each panel. But really, they come together in a, in a very, very soft way to create uh, a, a beautiful facade. So this is taken from the exterior uh, when it was in construction. This is still in construction. This is uh, one of the lobby spaces. And of course, the internal spaces also uh, of the courts uh, takes on the same uh, fluted uh, element. So they are made up of uh, actually very, very cost effective uh, uh, birch ply that are stacked together so that there are holes in between the ply and behind it uh, uh, absor uh, acoustic absorbers. So for, for the court, uh, for, for the judge's tower or the staff towers, uh, again, the budget is actually quite low for this building. So we really utilize a very, very simple grid in which the grid begins to contract and expand uh, uh, vertically. And it basically uh, comes together where the, the cores are and the toilets and, and uh, is placed. And they begin to open up where you, where you need uh, light and you need views. And of course, it also horizontally, it also contracts and expands and begin to draw your eye upwards uh, from this tower. So from this is taken from a very, very tight urban context. So it appears quite differently. And this is just before you, uh, it was completed. You begin to see those uh, placement of different uh, 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 bridges. So this, this, is, this is how um, the gardens at the bottom of the tower should, should be. It is still not completed. 
this is taken when they were installing uh, the windows and cleaning the windows. So, but you begin to see the different uh, bridges as it crosses the void. This, I, I like this photo a lot. Um, it really brings together three moments of the life of the city in the past uh, 60 years. In the foreground is the shop houses that I was telling you about. And then the 1970s uh, skyscrapers. And at the back is our new addition to the city. Okay, I think I, I, I will stop here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, that was, uh, it was just a phenomenal lecture. Uh, and it was, a, for me, fascinating to see a, sort of not just the quality of the work, but how your practice uh, in many ways has boomed in a very short period of time. Uh, this, this is a, are a lot of projects uh, that have come together with a very rigorous uh, threat that ties uh, the tie all of them. So uh, thank you, thank you uh, a lot for the presentation. I'm sure there are plenty of questions from the audience. So will you take a few questions? Great. So um, for the audience, just feel free to uh, either raise your hand uh, with the participant uh, uh, button or type a question uh, in the chat. Uh, even though raising your hand might actually work better in terms of uh, um, a, a organization. And as we start getting um, a, some questions, maybe I'll start with, uh, uh, with an initial uh, question. A, you speak, of course, a, a, in your introduction a, about sort of, a, sort of the larger history of typology, primarily uh, of the 20th century and the work that sort of that influences, uh, sort of the, the way that that influences your work in terms of developing a common framework. It, but one of the aspects that I have find uh, fascinating about typology in that I think your work addresses, but you haven't sort of spoken uh, directly about it, is this issue of typology in relationship to resiliency. Uh, that as we sort of begin to speak about sort of issues of uh, uh, climate change uh, and environmental uncertainty, mm. there's nothing more resilient than typology, actually, yeah. right? Because it has this ability to adapt it, over time. So I wonder if you could sort of speak a little bit about the relationship of, uh, um, a, a, of typology to issues of uh, uh, resiliency. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's, that's a really, really good question, Felipe. So I, I think I can answer this in two ways. So the first one, of course, is, is that through Rossi, we know that there's a certain uh, um, uh, qualities to persistent architecture that is able to elude uh, programmatic failures, right? Mm -hmm. So that is to say that if a type, uh, if a building typology has persisted in the history of the city, it is also one that has been sanctioned by use and by, by cultural norms. And because it has been sanctioned by use and cultural norm, it also therefore has the robustness and the resiliency, right? That is demonstrated over time and therefore is able to index similar or cultures that evolves from that, that, that starting point. So that resilience uh, and that uh, uh, um, uh, permanence uh, of structure coupled with uh, the ability to index uh, uh, programmatic uh, uh, transformation is one that makes um, uh, an, a typological approach to architecture, at least for me, so useful and so powerful. Now, the other aspect of resilience, uh, of course, I just spoke about programmatic uh, uh, elasticity. Uh, the other one has to do with the way in which uh, the, the architecture and using typology and persistent architecture has to do with um, the rate of change uh, that we see uh, in, in, in urbanization today. By precisely using an architecture that is familiar, that has proven to, 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 to to be able to work in different programmatic and cultural contexts is also to allow a certain familiarity right of the new work to be situated within a context so that is to say that using something familiar is able uh, allows a certain architecture to in a way regulate uh, the rate of change in rapid uh, urbanization No, I think that that's, uh, a, a, that is actually uh, very, very clear. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a couple of other questions. Robin, uh, Professor Robin Drips has a question. Hi, Chris, this was a, a fabulous lecture and uh, I was really 
intrigued by your last answer because uh, I've been um, interested in writing on typology for a long time. And generally speaking, um, um, both uh, an advocate for and a skeptic for, um, mostly because of the um, conflation of the type and the model. Because yes. I find it's mostly due to people like Pevsner and oh, others uh, more recent um, that, that have uh, looked at very specific um, elements of architecture. And what I find you doing uh, very interestingly is, I, I hope I'm right, um, uh, is, is, is looking at the uh, spatial aspects of how people are gathering. So when you look at the, uh, the, the agora or the, uh, or the courtyard or spaces of gathering or spaces of uh, individual reflection um, and different forms of gathering, you're not looking at kind of necessarily the physical embodiment of something uh, as a kind of, well, let's say the material embodiment of something. You're looking at the, um, uh, the way it, it, it allows people to be in a social or political um, uh, arrangement. Um, if it, it, th that's the way I'm kind of interpreting your building and your, 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 your take on, on typology. Yes. And I'm finding it um, very exciting to then see that allied with uh, what uh, Felipe was talking about and what you've been talking about uh, of, of resilience. So um, um, uh, thank you for uh, <laughs> invigorating the whole project of typology. No, I mean, thank you. I think you've been very kind to to read it that way. And uh, I completely agree. Uh, a lot of um, uh, proponents sometimes of typology is that it focuses too much on the notion of type as a model. And therefore, it bec becomes almost a taxonomy of forms devoid of any cultural uh, and, and political and social uh, bearings. And if we were to re return to the very first definition of type that is provided by Quatemi de Quincy, of course, his definition is type should be the idea that should rule over the model, as he calls it. And it is precisely this idea that is important. And actually, one could trace um, this formulation by Quatemi right uh, back to Aristotle. Yes. That is to say that if typology or type uh, is essentially an idea that is common, right? Because if it is not common, it is not a type, right? Because type essentially is, is an idea or a model that has, a, has shared characteristic. So by definition, it is an idea which is common. And therefore, we could bring it all the way to Aristotle to say that there is no space par excellence than the city and and in extension to that is the architecture of the city, right? So I think you're absolutely right to say that when one approaches typology, one should not lose track that, uh, of what Quatemet is saying, that uh, type first and foremost is the idea, right? And it is the idea that has its reification in the physical aspect of it, which is the model. I completely agree to, 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 to that. Very good. Thank you, uh, Robin. I think Devin uh, has a question. Uh, Devin, yes. I'll you. Sure. Thank you, Chris. That was a, an amazing lecture. Uh, I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Virginia. I, I was fascinated by your description of, of how you're, uh, in your practice, you're incorporating some of these ideas of the deep structure of, of the city. Uh, as, as kind of outlined by Rossi and, and also the way that those, some of those ideas you've translated into other contexts like the traditional uh, Chinese city and things like that. In, in your description of those uh, ideas, it, it, I couldn't help but think to, you know, the North American context, which is one in which you've, you've been teaching, uh, you know, obviously for, for a while as well. And just thinking also about the, the, the kind of idea of, of landscape and how it also fits into this idea of the architecture of the city. And, and Rossi never really wrote on it explicitly, but I, I think it's interesting if you think about, you know, someplace like in North America or New York, you could think of New York as being an extension of somehow this idea of, of the American idea of kind of um, subdividing huge swaths of land and kind of that kind of translating into a new hybrid model of the city, which is much more contemporary in a sense. It, so I guess my question would be to ask, you know, how, you know, 
even incorporating some kind of new ingredient like ideas of landscape into the city could, you know, what is the value of the kind of experimentation or hybridization that might come from adding ingredients and, and how these might translate even to other contexts like, you know, the traditional European city and the traditional Chinese city. I, I, I think uh, I've shown two examples, uh, the, the historical European city and of course uh, the ancient Chinese uh, city. Uh, really is to show two, um, I, I would say, an incredible uh, two examples of thinking about the city in very, very uh, long, what do you call, uh, long history, right? Now, it doesn't mean that I think uh, such uh, a reading um, should be applied to an American city, right? Uh, if I say that with a historical European city, we could read it as housing and monument rule and exception in, in, in the Chinese city is all rule and no exception. And both in a way uh, correspond to the very idea of the city via Aristotle or the very idea of the city, let's say through Confucius uh, and, and um, uh, yin, yin and yang uh, uh, concepts. Now I'm not, uh, uh, what we shouldn't do is to apply this reading to um, the American city. If anything, we could use uh, the way of reading rather than the reading itself, right? Now I'm not an expert uh, in, in, uh, in the American city, but uh, I would, point to, let's say, uh, Albert Pope uh, in, in using almost quite similar uh, approach to reading of the city, but applied to uh, the American city. And I think he argues that quite well is essentially is uh, you read it almost as a ladder, right, uh, in which the grid could be seen as a ladder and is the reification of the, um, the extreme desires for atomization in the way in which we think about the space of coexistence. So, so yeah, I would say you could use the same approach, but not the same reading. Very good. Thank you, uh, Chris. We have a couple of questions uh, in the chat. A one which actually uh, deals with issues of open space uh, in your buildings and the management of noise uh, and sound. Uh, and I wonder if you could sort of speak a little bit about how you actually deal with those, uh, uh, with the issue of sound in, uh, uh, in your buildings. Uh, uh, is, is there anything specific in which, in which, in which project or is it a general question? Is there? Yeah. Jeff, maybe you can just sort of unmute your uh, um, microphone and uh, uh, just speak directly. Oh, uh, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, no, no, I was talking to Jeff who wrote the uh, question. Uh, okay. Hi, Chris, can you hear me? Yes, yes, hi, Jeff. Hi, um, I was just wondering, um, with some of your projects, especially the one with the tables, I know it wasn't built, but just um, with such an open space, do you think there would be an issue with um, listening to other people's lectures or having something like that distract the students? Uh, yes, that there, there is, and and uh, in fact, that was one of the um, uh, um, weakness that was brought up by uh, the jurors. I think we were incredible. We were incredibly taken by um, the the power of the table structure, and we really just pushed the project to its logical conclusion. Uh, but in hindsight, you are right, uh, there will be some acoustic leakages, but uh, I didn't show you, but we did do a study uh, to show the use of baffle ceilings as well as uh, baffle boards and if really required to use curtains where, where certain spaces could be isolated if need be. So you are right, uh, the table structure do have those uh, problems. Uh, there are mitigation measures towards it, but in that project, uh, we really just push um, the spatial uh, potential of the table structure. Uh, in a way, it's, it's, it's very conceptual at that point, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you. Yeah. Chris. Uh, there's an additional question that says, thanks for uh, the inspiring lecture. Uh, it's clear that the inside-outside relationship, both physical and visual, is important in all your projects to connect the programming to its context. Bridge disparate, bridge disparate functions inside the building and ultimately create unrestricted public space. How do you think this design thinking could be used in cooler and more uh, fluctuating climates? 
so, uh, great question. So let's say in uh, in the table structure, uh, that's in in London. So that's a London has is temperate. Uh, we have winter and, and summer as well. So I think uh, there are many ways to do it. There's a visual certain visual transparencies, but also within the building itself, the use of the table structure really really does that. So I think uh, there are different ways to 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 do it in different climates. So I, I think of course I showed in the tropics is easier. Although it seems easier, but um, but you will see that actually uh, uh, in the tropics, actually people tend to retreat indoors as much as let's say in winter in temperate countries that people also retreat indoors. It's because the the heat is so tremendously great. Uh, so we uh, we deliberately always create a lot of shade and use landscape to as an environmental buffer to make those transition. So I can imagine uh, a table structure is one that also creates this uh, what you call a buffer, environmental buffer between let's say zero degrees to let's say about uh, 12 or 15 degrees and then indoors uh, at about uh, 20 degrees. So we, there, there is potential to, to really think about uh, spaces in this manner. Yeah, I mean, a, 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 an interesting point that, uh, uh, that I think this question is also raising uh, is that in the tropics, a lot of outdoor and collective space is occupied at night. Yes. Uh, right, people go out at night where yes. the heat is less uh, uh, intense and I wonder if uh, uh, this is something, for example, that you bring into your buildings because it, it allows you in many ways to sort of give it a life cycle that goes beyond sort of the working day. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So if you see in NUS, uh, in, in the School of Design, so a lot of uh, the site spaces where, where the screens are, so all these spaces are interconnected with the main studio spaces. And if you go to the school today, uh, uh, students really begin to spill out uh, into these different spaces to work at night, precisely because, as you said, Felipe, it becomes cooler at night and, and they could use this space. Uh, the court buildings is harder because there's a security threshold because uh, of the sensitive nature of the building. But uh, in, in all, even in Oasis Terrace, uh, really all the open spaces are, are used uh, uh, a lot uh, when, when the heat subsides. Absolutely, yeah. Very good. Any other sort of questions? No? Well, Chris, thank you so much. This has been a, a phenomenal presentation, uh, a great conversation. Um, we uh, um, owe you a, a dinner and uh, uh, we would be taking you out for, for lunch or dinner after this lecture and of course a longer visit to uh, UVA. So hopefully this is just the beginning of, uh, of a longer collaboration with, uh, uh, with the university. So once again, thank you uh, and a pleasure to have you even if it's via Zoom at the moment. You know, th thank you so much, Felipe. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. Real, really good to see you again. And, and really, uh, congratulations. It's a, uh, amazing work that I see coming out of the school uh, after you. you've joined, Felipe. We, we, we do miss you terribly. So uh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Great thank you, guys. You thank you. Soon. Take All care. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.